Hello middle primary kids, I'm Luke Kennedy and I'm excited to be sharing your lessons with you today. I suppose I should tell you what we have ahead of us. In English we'll be learning how to make characters come to life, mathematics will focus on understanding maps, and science will be a study of heat energy. So get comfortable and concentrating because we are ready to begin with English. Our favourite characters in stories are the ones that we can really relate to, no matter whether we love them or love to hate them. How authors describe these characters leads to our engagement with them. Pascal is going to look at how authors build a character in a narrative. Hello. Do you have a favourite character from a story? What is it you like about them so much? Authors try to make their characters really come to life so that readers can relate to them and want to read more about them. Authors reveal their characters and help the reader connect with them through their language choices. It is these choices that show us the character's unique traits. Character traits are the specific features or qualities that describe parts of a character's personality or nature or underlying values and beliefs, such as loyalty, honesty or bravery. What are the traits of your favourite characters? Are they funny, fearless, or maybe they are incredibly clever? Today, we're going to look at a character from a narrative and try to identify their traits by building a character profile. I'm reading a great quest story at the moment called The Cauldron of Tamui. It tells the legend of a magical cauldron buried deep in an enchanted forest. Maybe you've heard of it. You might like to ask your teacher to help you find the ebook. Remember that a quest story is a literary text where the main character goes on an adventurous journey and is met with a series of problems or obstacles which they overcome. There's a great character in the book named Oshi. I bet we could find out what her character traits are, but how can we work this out? Do you remember our QAR strategies? We can use these strategies to work out who Oshi is. Information about character traits can be found either in the book or in your head. If we're looking in the book, we can find some examples that the author has used. The author uses the noun group, a shy smile, to describe Oshi. You can see right there in the book what the character is like. A shy smile tells me that Oshi is a shy but hopeful person. Authors may also use verbs to help you build a picture in your mind about a character. For example, in the beginning of the story, the verb sobbing relates to Oshi's actions. This tells me she is a sensitive character. Poor Oshi. Authors can use other ways to build a picture of the character. Look at the sentence, even though she knew it inside and out, Oshi never tired of listening to the elders tell the story of the magical cauldron. This gives you more information about how Oshi feels about the situation. These words might make you think in your head about what you have done or seen in a similar situation. You may think, I used to have a favourite story that my family read to me. I would wait to hear it each night. Maybe that's how Oshi feels too. All of these words tell me a lot about this character. What else can we discover about Oshi? We know from the text that she lives on one side of the enchanted forest. It says, Kadafin and Oshi lived on opposite sides of the enchanted forest. We know from the image and text on this page that she lives with her elder, who is sitting at the head of the table, and with her sister and two brothers. And the text tells us that the village Oshi lives in is poor and that they often don't have enough to eat. It says they often went to bed hungry. We also know from the text and the images on this page that even though her family laughed at her, Oshi still went looking for the cauldron. And we know that when she meets Kadafin, they become friends. You can tell this from the noun group, the two new friends, and from the picture of Kadafin comforting Oshi when she is crying. 
Let's create a profile for Oshi. Our character profile will include some notes on her appearance, what she looks like, dialogue, feelings, thoughts, and actions. We can use the illustrations to describe Oshi's appearance. She's a young girl with blue and black hair. She wears a hat and carries a backpack. That could show that she is ready for adventure. Is there some dialogue that Oshi says that tells us about her? What about how she says, my family laughed at me when I told them I was going to look for it? That shows she has determination and can think for herself, even if people tease her, doesn't it? So, how is Oshi feeling? At this point of the story, I think the noun group A Shy Smile tells readers how she is feeling. She feels hopeful about the future. Is there something that tells us Oshi's thoughts? I think the way she loves listening to the legend of the cauldron shows that she has an excellent imagination. We can also note Oshi's actions. Remember she is sobbing when she meets Kadafin, but when they become friends and decide to go on the journey together, she is much happier. Well, that is a great character profile. It tells us a lot about how the author has created the character of Oshi. And remember, at the beginning of a quest story, the main character may appear to have character traits that are not appropriate for a quest. Often, by the end of the story, this has changed and the main character is seen differently by others. They can also see themselves differently. I wonder how Oshi will develop into a fearless leader doing heroic deeds as the quest continues. I wonder if Kadafin and Oshi ever find the magic cauldron. You could find a quest story and complete a character profile just like in our example. What novel or movie will you choose? Well, that's it for today. See you next time. I'm just looking at a map on my phone to find out how to get to the cafe that I've chosen for lunch. It's a little hard to tell how far it is from here because the distance looks different when I zoom out to what it does when I zoom in. What I need is a scale on my map to show me exactly how far from the cafe I am. Then I would know if I need to walk there or catch a bus. Fortunately, Annie is here to talk to us about scales and directions on maps. Maps have been used for thousands of years to help people share information about the location of cities and landscape features like rivers, mountains and deserts. Maps represent the real world on a much smaller scale. We use maps for lots of different purposes. They help us work out where we are and help us plan a path to get to a destination. When we use a map to find a pathway from one place to another, it is called navigation. Maps are used to navigate on land, at sea and in the air. There are even maps that can help navigation in space. Today, you might find a map in a shopping centre, on a tourist pamphlet or even in an app on your phone. Everyone needs to know how to use maps. But there are a few things you need to know to be able to read information off a map or to use a map for navigation. Some of these you may already know from previous lessons. You will need to know the compass points, north, south, east and west. Do you remember our catchphrase? Never eat slimy worms. You will also need to know the in-between compass points Northeast, Northwest, Southeast, and Southwest. Understanding the common features of maps will also be useful. These include legends, icons or symbols, and scale. Today, we're going to take a closer look at scale. When we draw a map, 
It is a representation of a real-life place. This representation will always be smaller than real life. Can you imagine what maps would be like if they were life-sized? A map of your house would be as big as your house. A map of your town would cover the whole town. And a map of Australia? Well, that would be crazy. So it's easy to see that real-life maps wouldn't be very helpful and that one of the best things about maps is that they can show us a large amount of information in a small space. A very simple map may not have a scale. It may just have some symbols on it that show the relative position of landscape features. These maps can be confusing and are not as useful as maps with a scale. Scale is the information that tells us how much smaller the map is, the map is drawn, compared to actual size. Here are a few different maps. Notice how they are similar in size, but they represent different areas. We say they use a different scale. Let's use our map reading skills to find and identify the scale on each of these maps. Scale shows the relationship between two numbers. A map may use a scale like one centimeter equals one meter. Because one centimeter is the smaller measurement, we know that this is the measurement on the map. If we measure one centimeter on the map, then that is equal to one meter of actual distance. If we measure two centimeters on the map, then that is equal to two meters at actual size, and so on. Different maps use different scales. Let's try using a different scale to practice our navigation skills. A map of Australia might use a scale like one centimetre equals 500 kilometres. Again, we can identify the map measurement easily as that is the smallest value. Every one centimetre on the map is equal to 500 kilometres in actual distance. If we measure two centimetres on this map, then because the scale is different, it equals 1,000 kilometres in actual distance. I wonder if you can solve this challenge question. If we travelled 2,000 kilometres of actual distance, how far would we have moved on the map? One centimetre equals 500 kilometres. Two centimetres equals 1,000 kilometres. Four centimetres equals 2,000 kilometres. Using this scale, four centimetres on the map would mean we travel 2,000 kilometres in actual distance. Let's recap navigation and scale with an activity. Navigation is the term we use when we plan a pathway from one point to another. Here is our game board and the scale has been added. Each square on the grid represents a one metre square. To play the game, start at the star. I will read directions to you and you can use your navigation skills to follow a pathway to a destination. If you can follow the directions correctly, we will end up at the same animal. Ready? From the star, move two metres north. Move two metres east. Move one metre north. Where did you end up? If it was a rhinoceros, you navigated correctly. Let's try another. Start at the star. Move three metres east. Turn to face north and go forward three metres. Now move two metres west. Turn to the south and move forward two metres. What animal is one metre to your right? The elephant. How did you go? If you got a bit lost, remember that the elephant is on your right because you are facing towards the bottom of the game board. I think we are ready to try using a different map with all the common map features. A compass point showing north, legend, icons, and a scale. This map also has a grid to help us measure distances. 
We're going to use the plan of this classroom to practice using a different scale. The scale on the classroom plan is one centimetre represents one metre. So on this plan, each square represents one metre in real life. Look at the window. The length of the window on the map is two squares, or two centimetres. So using the scale, the window is two metres long in real life. Now let's use the scale to find the dimensions of the classroom. There are 15 squares along the length of the classroom and 10 squares along the width. This means it measures 15 centimetres long and 10 centimetres wide on the plan. The scale tells us that each centimetre is one metre in real life, so the classroom is 15 metres long and 10 metres wide in real life. Now one more. Let's use the scale to find the dimensions of the teacher's desk. It is three squares long and one square wide. Using the scale, the teacher's desk is three metres long and one metre wide in real life. That's a big desk. OK, let's recap what we've learned today. Map reading skills are important for everyone. Navigation is when we find a pathway from one place to another. And maps have features that help us to navigate and share information. Common features of maps include legends, compass points and scale. And a scale tells us how much smaller the map is compared to actual size. Thanks for joining me today. See you next time. Hello. Have you enjoyed reading any good books lately? Reading is most enjoyable when we can understand the words that we are reading. Let's share some tips that will help you to make reading more enjoyable. Do you know what visualising is? Readers who visualise make a movie in their head as they read. Good readers use a range of strategies to help them make sense of what they read. Visualising is a helpful strategy where you create a personal picture of what the author has written. When we visualise what the author has written, we focus on the key details to make the words come alive in our mind. So how does visualising help us read? Often, creating a movie in our head helps us to see the characters, be a part of the setting or experience the action. To help our movie flow and make sense, we need to comprehend or understand the text. Would you like to have a go? Let's see if you can visualise my description. Get ready to create a movie in your mind from the words I say. A rich red splosh dripped ever so slowly onto the floor as the long loops of spaghetti dangled from the table. Hmm. What picture did you make in your head? I saw a messy dinner table covered in spaghetti with red pasta sauce dripping onto the floor. I wonder if your visual was similar to mine. Next time you are reading, try visualising what the author has written by creating a movie in your head. Have you ever had the experience of running out to check the letterbox without your shoes on and burning your feet on the cement driveway? Well, I have, and I had to stand on the grass nearby to cool down my toes. Why isn't everything that the sun shines on the same temperature? Well, the answer is in heat energy, and that is what David will explore in Science Today. Hi. Today we're going to show you a fun activity that you can try at home. We went outdoors on a heat safari. We want to understand more about heat. 
Now, most of the heat in our world comes from the sun. Everything outside has had the sun shining on it this morning. So let's find out whether the same amount of heat energy has transferred into each of the materials that we find. We'll investigate this scientific question. Do all materials heat up the same amount in the sun? So to test how much heat has been transferred to each material, we'll use our sense of touch to decide whether it was warmer or cooler than our hand, or about the same. Earlier this morning, I went outside on my heat safari and I recorded some video of my observations. First, we tried some natural materials. This big leaf, it's about the same temperature as my hand. It doesn't feel warmer or cooler. The grass was a bit cooler than my hand. The wooden table feels about the same temperature as my hand. Next, I tried a great big rock. Hmm. It was a bit cooler than my hand. Then we tried some man-made materials. The black bitumen car park, it's quite warm. This light coloured brick wall, it's not as warm as my hand, it was a bit cooler. The white metal roof of this car was quite hot and the black car's roof, it was even hotter. This silver painted metal railing, it's about the same as my hand but the black painted railing was much warmer. Okay, so I've used photos of the materials that were tested to show the results of our investigation in a table. A table will help us to organise our observations by grouping objects that felt cooler or the same or warmer than my hand. Now, remember our scientific question, do all materials heat up the same amount in the sun? Well, our data shows that three materials were cooler than my hand. Three materials were about the same temperature as my hand, and four materials were warmer than my hand. All the materials we tested had been in the sun for the same amount of time. But the data show that some things were warmer and some were cooler. So we've answered our scientific question. We have some evidence that more heat from the sun had been absorbed by some of the materials. Can you think of any reasons that some things collected more heat from the sun? Let's take a closer look at the data in each column of the table and see if we can find any patterns to explain this. Look closely at the properties of the materials. Can you see a pattern in the colour of the material? Light or dark? The surface, is it shiny or matte? One reason for the difference is colour. Have you noticed, if you're out in the sun, that you get hotter if you're wearing black clothes or a hat than if you wore a pale colour? This hat's always cooler. Light colours reflect the sun and they reflect the heat away. Dark colours collect more heat. Another reason is the type of surface. Some heat is reflected away by shining, shiny material. Have you seen the um, silver reflective sunscreens that people put against their windscreen in their car sometimes if they're parked in the sun? It's the same reason that the silver railing that I tested wasn't as hot as the black one. After looking closely at the data, we could also conclude that the properties of materials affect how much they heat up. The colour and the type of the surface both affect the amount that materials heat up. I think we've got a few more questions now. Could we make this investigation more like a fair test? What could I use to accurately measure the temperature of materials more accurate than my hands? And what other fa factors could be affecting the heat transfer? They're questions for another day. But now it's time to look back on what we've learnt today. Today we've learnt that first, different materials heat up differently in the sun. Second, the properties of materials affect how much the materials heat up. And third, we can use a table to help organise data so that we can see patterns. 
today we went on a heat safari outdoors, but I was the only one who could feel the temperature of the materials. So now it's your turn to do a heat safari at home. I wonder what materials you can find. If you collect some data after you've made observations and then you record your findings, you'll be working like a scientist. Have fun. Well done, everyone. It has been a pleasure to share your lessons with you, and I'm gonna let you take a brain break now. Then Victoria will be here to start the ball rolling with the upper primary students. Bye now. Hi, I'm Jane. Hi, I'm Riley, and I'm in year five. What's your favourite physical activity, Riley? Handball, because it is competitive and fun. Do you know some fitness moves that can help keep us strong and active? Squat jumps and push-ups. Righto, let's have a go at some of those moves right now. Make sure it's safe. Let's get down in squat position and jump up off the balls of our feet and reach. And one more. Push-ups. Down on the floor. I'm doing knee bent push-ups. Riley's doing a full push-up. And the last one is a? V-sit. This is for our tummy muscles. Hands beside you for balance. Point your toes and relax. One more. Stretch. Hold it, hold it in. And thank you for moving with us today. Enjoy the rest of your day of learning. <laughs>